Our congregational Bible reading for this past week closed out the book of Galatians. If you are reading along, you can read the book of Ephesians this week as our congregational Bible reading, the book of Ephesians. This verse, the 19th verse that was just read, is one of the most picturesque verses in Scripture. Because the image that Paul gives concerning his desire for the Galatian brethren is rich because we all can see an image of the concept of giving birth and what his intention was and the intensity with which he had it. For a few minutes, I want you to think with me about this phrase, till Christ is formed in you. The book of Galatians is written to a group of churches in an area called Galatia. What's interesting about that is we're not really sure where that is. Now, if you turn to the back of your Bible, probably you're thinking right now, well, wait a minute, I got a map in my Bible. I can prove him wrong. I turn over and it says Galatia right there. Well, that's right, because that's the best we can do about it. Uh, but the people I was reading said that the boundaries of it are not really that certain. It's generally true that it is somewhere northwest of what we understand Turkey to be, maybe in that area, and heading over toward Asia. But that's about it. Here's another thing that's interesting to me. We don't know what churches were in Galatia. We know that Paul visited there, Acts 16 and Acts 18, on his second and third missionary journey, passing through there. But we don't know what churches they're talking about. When we read about Galatia, we know one of the most famous passages, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1, when Paul was writing to the Corinthians about the Lord's Supper, and he said, give as I've told the Galatian churches to do. We know that, and we know that they were originated by the persecution of Saul in Acts 8 when they were dispersed, and Peter talked about them in 1 Peter chapter 1, the dispersion in Galatia. This was to catch the kids' attention. That's what it's about right there. This whole thing about morphing. We're going to look at that in a minute. And that'll be up there in a small way. Kids will stay focused on that the whole time. But it takes and makes the point that I want us to see here are people that Paul knew well, but he was so connected to them that he wanted Christ to form in them, and it was such a connection that he compared it to the birthing process. Earlier in the book of Galatians, Paul was talking about the fact that he had persecuted the Lord's church and that people, when he started preaching, were wondering, isn't this the guy that was persecuting us and now he's preaching that very same thing? Interesting. It's interesting that he says the word again. He said, I'm suffering with birth pangs again, indicating that his first time that he was there, he connected with them and he was intensely involved with them in trying to help them understand what God wanted them to know and by extension, he is telling us what God wants us to know about forming Christ within us. There are two points that I want to make about this verse. The first one is this. It takes effort. It takes effort. Those of us who have been through the birthing process, ladies who've given birth and the men who were standing there being squeezed on the hand, hoping that we would feel the same thing they were feeling. We've been there, right? 
And we know what that whole thing is about. And this is not a passive thing. It takes effort. Paul said, I want Christ to form in you by effort. In contrast to that, it seems like instead that convenience rules our day. There are a number of Bible characters who wanted convenience, not effort. In the story in Matthew 25, when Jesus tells about the man who was going on a journey and he divided his wealth among his servants to take care of while he was gone, Two of them actually used the money to make more, and one buried it in the ground because he didn't want to do anything. He wanted convenience. He wanted what was easy. He wanted what was easy. He didn't want to spend any effort. He wanted to be convenient. That's what happens with us? I think sometimes I see convenience amongst us as Christians because we don't want to spend the effort that it takes and we want it to be easy. Let it be easy for us. The disciples in Matthew 15 were dealing with a situation where this woman was wandering or following after them as they followed Jesus. And she was wanting to talk to Jesus. And the disciples said, send her away. She's bothering us. You see, they were impatient. And they wanted it to be immediate. Either take care of the situation or get her out of the way. Don't let us keep having to put up with this over and over and over. How often in your experience of Christianity do you have to face the fact that things don't happen immediately? We have to be patient. Convenience says, I want it now. But sometimes it just can't be right now. The prodigal son in Luke 15, his situation was that he wanted to have his money, go wherever he wanted, and just party all the time and not think and worry about anything. He didn't want to have any thoughts. He wanted a thoughtless existence because the Bible says almost like this. He woke up one day and he had no money. What am I going to do? And I think about that radio commercial that I hear quite often where a man is agitated. He says, I can't find it, I can't find it, I can't find it. And, and this woman says, what are you looking for? My savings. What do you mean you can't find it? Where did you last have it? Well, I went on a vacation and I spent a whole bunch of money and I got home and my savings are gone. Is that how it happens? Yeah. Because without thinking and planning, it's just gone. There are people who don't want to think. They just want to exist. The convenient mindset says, don't make me think. In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, there's a man named Demas. This man started out as a disciple. But according to that verse, he forsook God having loved the present world. Convenience for him said, I want to be comfortable. Comfortable. And therefore, I don't want any effort. I just want it to be comfortable. Make it easy for me. In a day and time when we can drive in warm or cool cars to a warm or cool building, to sit on padded pews with all the light we need, all the niceties of life, and then you get a chance to go someplace else like Guyana, where when we were there, there were people who walked for two hours just to get to an evening assembly of worship. Comfortable? 
That's the convenient mindset. But guess what? It's exactly opposite of what ought to be. It was Jesus who said in Luke chapter 14, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his brother and sister, his wife, his child, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Verse 33, if you come to me and do not forsake all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. Convenience has never been a part of the recipe of Christianity. And yet that is exactly what many people are looking for. But that's exactly why it is so repulsive to God. In Revelation 13, or, verse, or chapter 3 that is, he spoke about the Laodicean church. And he said that you're neither cold nor hot, you're lukewarm. And I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Lukewarm means doing nothing, sitting still, taking it easy, not thinking Lukewarmness makes God sick. Well, convenience seems to rule our day. But I will promise you effort will have ruled the final day. It is said in Romans chapter 2 and in verse 6 uh, that God will judge according to each one's deeds. God does not judge partially. He judges without partiality as each one has done. 1 Peter 1 verse 17. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one of us may receive what we've done, whether good or evil. Effort. I'm not saying that effort is the kind of effort that can make me be able to say, oh, look what I did by myself. Tonight, we're actually going to address that topic. Because Paul says he boasts in Christ. Well, I, don't be able, I shouldn't be able to boast in my effort. But neither should I say that my efforts are unnecessary. Because forming Christ inside of us takes effort. Paul said, I travail in birth again. He'd done it one time. He's willing to continue to do it. Because he was so concerned about them. The second point that I want to make is not only does it take effort to form Christ in us, it also is a process. It's a process. Now, when my children were young, especially Austin, he was a, a big Power Rangers guy. And man, it was immediate, wasn't it? When the Power Rangers were called upon to morph into whatever it was they were, it was just immediate. It went from one to the other. They even have those, I haven't been able to do them, but kids have those cars that you can flip around and become a person. Then you flip it around, it's a car or a truck. I never have been able to do those things. But that's exactly what we're talking about, immediate. But in the process of forming Christ, it takes a lifetime. This word used here. Forming is a word morphe. And it means to have an outward expression of a necessary inner substance that puts the two together equally. I tried to think if there was a way that I could morph something on the screen. You've seen them. You take a face and all of a sudden you morph it into something else. That's the idea he's talking of here. In fact, that's the word that's used where we get our word, metamorphosis, from this Greek word. 
And it's an idea of having a goal and changing to meet that goal. But in scripture, it's not just about the external. It's changing the external to fit what is internal. That's the morph of Christ in you. There's a process according to scripture. Do you want to know how to form Christ in you? If God wants us to do that, if Paul wanted them to do that, he would surely tell us how. And God has said, here is how you can form Christ within you. Number one, it begins with a knock at the door. Revelation 3, verse 20. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens to me, I will come in to him. He will dine with me, and I will dine with him. To form Christ in your life, Begin, it begins with a knock at the door of your heart. Jesus, every day in some way, is knocking on the door of the hearts of people who don't yet know him. There are different ways that he might do it. He might do it through the word and thought of a Christian who's trying to influence that person. He might do it through some casual reading of Scripture that then seems to apply in a special way at that moment. I think God is involved in that process. Not as some would teach, that he overrides free will to do it, but rather he is involved to encourage, to request, to urge by knocking at the door. Number two, it is faith that opens the door. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. If a person wants to develop Christ in his or her life, the door opens when in faith you accept Jesus for who he said he is. And you open the door to let him come in. I plan in the month of June to address that topic this way. What are the things about Jesus that people trip over? What are the things about Jesus that people stumble over? There are a number of them. We're going to consider at least four. Because... Jesus presented himself in a certain way, and, and a person must be willing to say, okay, I accept that. And you take all of the multitude of evidence that leads to that conclusion, and you say, I accept it. And when you do, faith opens the door. Number three, it is the Spirit of God who walks through the door into your heart. The Bible says that Jesus dwells through us or in us through the Spirit whom was given to us. When you open the door in faith to Jesus Christ, the Spirit comes to live in that heart. And it is the spirit in your heart that will be the way by which Jesus will form in you. You must be willing to say, I want to be a person that the spirit of God would like to live in. And he will live in your life. And that's how the morphing process will begin. Number four, once the Spirit 
enters the door into your heart. The person behind the door begins to die. You're dead because of sin, but alive because of righteousness. Yes, we die to self to let Jesus live within us. But again, it's not immediate. It's not easy. It's a process. But our person must decide that I want to die to self. I want to get over me and let him take over when I'm willing to die continually to myself, Christ begins to form in me. And finally, five, I reach the point where I can say about myself the same as Paul said about himself. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is how Christ is formed in your life. And Paul so desperately wanted it for these people. So, if there's a door standing there barricading Christ from your life, if he's knocking and he wants to come in and by faith you open that door and the Spirit enters and you begin to die so that you can be crucified with Christ, that door is very important. It is the place at which a threshold is crossed. There are a lot of people who know about Jesus. There are a number of people who appreciate Jesus. There are a lot of people who understand moral principles and good things and, and they try to live to be good citizens and good neighbors and good friends and all of those things are good. But there's a point at which you cross the threshold where Christ can become, can come and live in your life and you begin to morph into him. And that point is real simple. It is the point at which a person moves from being outside, Christ outside, to Christ inside. By faith, we've all been baptized into Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 26, 27. You see... Baptism is like the threshold of a door opening. When you cross that, when he crosses that threshold into your life, at the point that you are immersed into him, at that point, he begins to morph in you as you allow it to happen. So today, maybe you don't have Christ in your life. Maybe you're working on having him form within you. And I pray that you continue, as I hope to, that process. I want to close with one more passage of Scripture. For all of us, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. For we all, with open face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being changed into that image from glory to glory. I hope that we are stressing the continual change from the glory of being created in the image of God to the glory of of having God's image 
morphing in us through his spirit that comes to us by faith when we follow what he wants us to do. Till Christ is formed in you. It's a lifelong process and effort that will lead finally to an eternity with him. If Christ is not forming in your life today and you're ready to start, we can immerse you this day into him. If you're working on forming him, continue the journey. If you need us to help you and pray for you in some way, we're willing to do it while we stand and sing to you.